Thank you for auditing the always positive new music review show hosted by a French professor who is going to seriously review the new album Hackney Diamonds by the Rolling Stones. Uh-oh. <laughs> uh, last time I reviewed the Rolling Stones, I reviewed their song Angry, and um, uh, the Rolling Stones fans were angry with me, even though my review was generally positive. And they're going to be angry at this as well. So if you're back again to say, what does this guy know? Hey, what's up? I'll see you in the comments. I'll read it. It's cool. Dialogue's wonderful. Uh, a much more successful uh, YouTuber than me, uh, Anthony Fantano, did basically a YouTube short review of this album, dismissed it in under a minute, <laughs> just saying, you know, they have nothing to say and it's not great. I understand that criticism. It's, it's fair. Uh, but I want to kind of build on it and sort of figure out what is it that they're saying? And more importantly, what audience is it serving? What is its intended audience getting from this album? And it's going to be a lot of interesting comments on age, uh, on mortality, uh, and uh, yes, on, on boomers. So <laughs> get ready to be pissed if, if that uh, annoys you right off the bat. I mean, right off the bat, I mean, the initial question is, and I ask this all the time with, with you know, legacy acts, you know, it's sort of not only, you know, why are the artists making it? What do they have to prove? But like, there's this weird question of like, like, I would never choose to listen to this over anything in their catalog made before 1985, right? So, just off the bat. And, and now that I listen to a lot of new music, I would never choose to listen to this over new rock and roll music that scratches a similar itch. I did a video on a band called The Witches, W-I-T-C-H-E-S, and explaining why, you know, you're much better off uh, listening to new you know, sort of blues-based rock and roll uh, than you are just listening to old guys doing it. But at the same time, I am insistent that I, I'm very happy this exists. I want the Rolling Stones, Paul McCartney, God bless him, Ringo Starr, Bob Dylan. I want these artists creating and making new art because they're artists. So even if what they make is not as meaningful, not as urgent, as what they used to make, I still think we need to take it in and appreciate it and have it be part of our, I don't know, understanding of the artist. I'm happy it exists and I want to hear it in concert. I'm gonna go one step further. If the Rolling Stones go on tour and only play songs off of Hackney Diamonds, I would prefer that to Jumping Jack, Flash, and all the same songs I've seen them play, what, three or four times and I've seen them in concert. You know, like I love the idea of old artists playing new music. Matter of fact, it's a sad slash happy story. I had tickets to see Bob Dylan uh, last night in Rochester, New York. I was going, it was going to be Boomer Week here on, uh, on the channel. Unfortunately, I was unable to go. Um, my daughter went and one of my proudest moments was she said that her favorite song was Key West. You know, which is a song off the new Bob Dylan album, you know? She wasn't just sitting there waiting for Rolling Stone. And, and that's the best thing I can say about this album, about Hackney Diamonds, is that it exists. And if you're too cynical to appreciate the fact that Keith Richards and Mick Jagger get together and make music together, I understand, but I am not too cynical for that. That doesn't mean I'm going to say, this is the greatest thing ever, they've still got it, there's no difference between this and Exile and Main Street. No, of course not. But let's just celebrate the fact that they're here, even if they don't have anything to prove or anything to say. They're making art. And isn't that saying something? You hear what I'm saying? I want to get some perspective on this. So I asked my brother and my nephew, who are realistically uh, bigger Rolling Stones fans and uh, more knowledgeable Rolling Stones fans than I am, and my brother gave a pretty succinct review, which I think is going to echo mine, but I think it sort of shows, because uh, um, I come across as, uh, <laughs> you may not know this, as kind of pompous. I don't know why. I don't know what I did to deserve such, a, such an attitude. It's not like I called my channel Professor Sky, uh, where I talk about my doctorate all the time, 17th century French literature. Uh, but hey, so my brother says, after one close listen, I really like the production. Percussion is great. Agreed. In general, the verses have good music and most of the choruses are okay, but the bridge, middle eights are lame. Totally agree on that, although I, I give more credit to the choruses than he does. Mick sings well, but I could care less about what he is singing about. There are actually some interesting turns of phrase, but overall the lyrics are meh. It is actually a genuinely strong effort. Some cool hooks and guitar tones. Guitar solos are not great. That's where I agree. I'm going to spend a lot of time talking about how good the hooks are on this album. The hooks are off the hook. I 
It's not in my notes, that is a regrettable joke, but it's true. The hooks are great on this album. And the guitar solo is like, come on. My nephew is a little bit more prolix in his response. I also agree it's a strong effort from everyone, and I like a lot of the singing and guitar playing. Sort of one extra note about my brother and my nephew is, is my brother still watches The Simpsons. And, and I, don't, I don't mean like every once in a while he turns it on. You know, every once in a while I turn it on. I've, I've watched probably, I don't know, 50% of Simpsons since season 10. My brother watches every week, multiple times. And I think that's actually a pretty good comparison. You know, that like, there's still a lot of great stuff in The Simpsons. And it's still great that they're out there and they're making, they're making shows. And every once in a while, there'll be a great episode or there'll be a great moment. And, and that shows an understanding and a love of art, which is perhaps deeper than if you just purely hold artists to their pinnacle and then just say their pinnacle is all that's worth studying. I didn't have that idea before hitting record, but I kind of like this idea. Also, to contextualize this album, I would say Keith Richards appeared on Howard Stern, and <laughs> he's a very, this is a very funny interview. Um, uh, not very funny, but okay. It, it was like one-tenth as insightful as Paul Simon's interview, uh, but it was a lot more entertaining. But what he said was that essentially he has to coax Mick Jagger into making music, that essentially that they would have more albums and more music, except Keith has to convince Mick to do it. Which I don't really know what to say, except that's an interesting dynamic in a band. So let's go through the album. Let's start off with the opening track, Angry. I've already done a whole video about that. A whole video about that one song. And uh, it's got 7,000 views, which is pretty good. Uh, I had a, a algorithmic catastrophe when I went on vacation this summer, so that's, that's a good number. Except... <laughs> 26% disliked the video. To give you context, channel as a whole, I have a 2% dislike rating. So I wanted to go through and really focus on why people disliked my comments. This is gonna be a little meta commentary. You can jump, matter of fact, I'll get to the review proper. I'll put a link in the, in the, in the description if you wanna jump over this sort of analysis of who is mad at my commentary and why. Brief review I gave of the song uh, is that it's very catchy, very well made, um, but also kind of lazy songwriting and fairly simple criticism, okay? The primary, the primary argument and anger that I received are from what I call butt hurt boomers, okay? <laughs> so old, certainly dudes who love the Rolling Stones and there's this funny thing that I've noticed in doing this channel. The more praise an artist receives, the less their fans receive criticism, okay? The greatest example is Bob Dylan. If you say anything against Bob Dylan, people jump down your throat, even though he's one of the most celebrated human beings on planet Earth, okay? Same thing with the Rolling Stones. There's one comment. He's 83, referring to Mick Jagger, and doing just fine. This is the key. This is what I think most of the people who listen to this music are getting out of it. It's this desire to think that you can rock like you did in the 60s when it's 2020. That you can be just as virile, just as vital in your 80s as you were in your 20s. 60s, 70s, okay? You can be an old guy and rock as hard as the young guys. Those are the people who are most mad at me. And if you're mad at me now, that's probably why. So I want to think about that for a second. Like what purpose, what good does that do? For, what does that do for the greater good? Okay, that's a great Carl Havoc once asked us. Like, what does it do? Like, why is that good? Because in reality, right? The way that we should be thinking is young people are always going to rock. Young people are always going to make the most vital music. They're just going to. Just get over it, old people, okay? Young people are going to make better culture than old people almost all the time. Not all the time, almost all the time. Just accept it. Your kids, your grandkids are going to be, first of all, smarter than you. Statistically, younger people are smarter than older people with no exception. That's a statistical fact, not an opinion. Sorry, boomers. Zoomers are smarter than you. Smarter than me, just the way it is. And then beyond that, why not accept that young people can make music? Why not accept that young people can rock as hard as you? Isn't that better for the future? 
So this comment, he's 83 and doing just fine. No, he's not. I mean, he's fine. He's great. Mick Jagger's wonderful. I hope he lives to be 100, okay? He's awesome. He's one of the greatest rock stars of all time. And yes, he is still a good rock star. But you know, he's not The weekend, <laughs> okay? He's, he's not Justin Bieber. And I'm not saying I prefer Justin Bieber's music to Rolling Stones, but you know, and one, of, one of my other favorite comments, your smart car, avocado toast, and white claw are ready for you. So this is an attack on me that I'm a millennial, which is great. It's cute that you think that I'm young enough to have ever drunk a White Claw. I'm not. I've never drunk a White Claw. Never drank in. Never drunk a White Claw. I have had avocado toast and a smart car. Uh, this guy is an ass. Don't analyze their music. Misspelled there. Uh, they are the greatest entertainers of all time. Criticism is fine and doesn't bother me at all. What bothers me is your apparent love of hearing yourself blather on with so little substance to any of it. Won't be back. Hey, that's fine. That's fine. I don't know why you click on a 40 minute video about a 10 minutes, a three minute song. And then there's this other bit here where I criticized uh, the, the appearance of Bill Wyman on the album. So if you don't know, Bill Wyman is the bass player of the Rolling Stones. He left the band uh, and he most certainly committed statutory rape and eventually married and then divorced the woman who he was having an affair with when she was a young teenager. Okay. I got a lot of response to that, angry response to that, saying that I'm woke. First of all, Sure, I'm woke. Well, whatever you think that means, I'm sure I'm that, okay? But like, it's coming. The, the, the reckoning of a lot of these rock stars is coming. Okay, I'm, I'm gonna quote Mick Jagger now. I can see that you're only 13 years old. I don't want your ID. You look so restless and you're so far from home. It's no hanging matter, it's no capital crime. I bet your mama doesn't know you can scream like that. Hey, that's a song where a guy says, you're only 13 years old and your mama doesn't know you can scream like that, okay? Oh yeah, oh go down in the comments and tell me she's 15. I'm talking about the live version of Stray Cat Blues off of Get Your Yaya's out, okay? I'm not talking about the studio version where she's 15. Still a crime, but not as bad, okay? It's coming, all right? The Rolling Stones will be canceled eventually. Now, you're talking, you, you listen to somebody who just yesterday was listening to James Brown with his baby, okay? I don't think canceling is a useful way to think about existence. And I think a lot of great art could be made by bad people, okay? But uh, still, it's worth acknowledging that there are very problematic views in a lot of the Rolling Stones. You ever seen uh, Robert Frank's uh, Cocksucker Blues with Rolling Stones? You ever find that the bootleg? I got a bootleg copy of it. I can tell you, it's not pretty. So anyways, um, that's an interesting criticism. It remains valid that a lot of their previous work, uh, I think, viewed through today's and even the, the mores of then are reprehensible and, and they can still be a great band. We can have both those opinions at the same time, but some people are mad at that. Some, <laughs> uh, one uh, angry comment I, I thought was interesting. It, it sort of reminded me, it was sort of a, Greg Turkington style review. Move over Ed Sheeran and Harry Styles. The Stones are back, reminding us what rock and roll is all about with their new songs and album. If the great granddaddies can get out their guitars and rock, then why can't the youngsters do the same? Five bags of popcorn. Yes, that's true, but they can do the same. And this is my whole point. If you are an old person watching this and you're mad at me for saying that the Stones aren't as good as they used to be, it's because I'm an old person who dedicates a lot of his time trying to figure out what good music is out there. There's still youngsters doing it all the time. You just have to look, okay? S subscribe to my channel. Check it out. I talk about it all the time. There's all these great rock bands out there, okay? So just, it's okay. The Stones were great. The Stones are fine. There's great rock bands now. And then a lot of the criticism came from super fans. To you, cool enough, man. Cool enough. Like, that's, that's fair. Like, I, I made some factual uh, mistakes. I, I didn't realize that Keith didn't play on Moonlight Mile. I didn't know. I don't know. I guess I missed that. I, I, that surprised me. That's cool. That, that's a full mix song. That's awesome. You know, so um, some people got very upset that I said uh, that I didn't know who was playing bass on the song. At the time when I reviewed the song, uh, the credits were wrong. They were wrong in title. Uh, they were wrong on, uh, on Lyric Genius. So that's how I didn't know who was playing bass. That, that's my mistake. That's fine. Uh, that's the kind of um actually crowd uh, that came on here. Uh, and then finally, there is the most convincing, 
the most convincing counter argument to my criticism, which is what I call the just enjoy folks. Dude, get out of your head so you can open your ears. It ain't biology, quit dissecting it and groove. Life's too short, man. To which I say, totally cool. Why, why, why are you on YouTube watching people talk about music if you don't want to hear people talk about music on YouTube? You want reactions? You want reactions? You're an idiot. If you want to watch people react to stuff, no offense, but you're an idiot. I, I like watching reactions sometimes too, but watching people go, oh yeah, that's not why I'm here, okay? So, cool, that's not me. It's not Professor Sky Reacts channel. So that was too harsh. Reaction videos are, are quite fun, depending on the personality of the people who makes them. Um, but they're only interesting in the personality of the people, not in the art itself. So, there you go. There's a brief overview of the criticism to, to my previous video on the Rolling Stones. And what I really wanna focus on is the sort of like, let's agree to disagree, okay? Because I think that everybody who is in favor of this album has to admit a few things on here, okay? I think you have to admit that they don't write great riffs anymore, okay? There, there's no brown sugar on this album. There's not even a start me up on this album. They can write good riffs, and if you squint, or if your eyesight is deteriorating because you're past the age of 40, you can maybe think that it's a great riff, but come on. It is an insult to their great riffs to say there are any great riffs on this album. The songwriting itself, a little lazy. The production, even though they're trying to have it be a little bit more raw, is still too clean. And they don't have much to say, but maybe they do. And maybe it's more than just old people still rock. So here are the things that I have to admit as someone who's critical of this album. They can still write great hooks. So they might not have great riffs, but this album is absolutely packed with earworms. And I've just, yeah, I've been listening to it for the last week. I have to admit it's awesome that they're making new songs. I've already discussed that. I have to admit that Steve Jordan is the best possible replacement for Charlie Watts. Now he said that while he was alive. Um, I didn't think on on um, I did not think on angry that he was the best, but he is a great replacement. I think that Mick is trying, like I think he's really trying, and I really appreciate that. You know, he's not just doing that thing of where he talks during the verse and then sings during the chorus. Um, it's a lot less lazy than most of the stuff I've heard from him in the last twenty years. And I also really have to admit that most of the songs are good, a couple of the songs are great, and only a couple of them are kind of bad. So, again, great. It's all produced by Andrew Watt. I don't understand who Andrew Watt is. <laughs> He's produced Iggy Pop and Justin Bieber. So, uh, there you go. I guess in between those two is the Rolling Stones. So let's, let's get more to the album here, okay? Let's go through it. I think the stamp of the album, my favorite song on the album is probably Get Close. I'll put a link to it if you haven't heard it yet. Featuring Elton John. I don't know why Elton John's on this album at all. I, he's just a piano player. But this song gets back to that thing that my brother was talking about. Like the rhythms and the percussion on the song are great. More great kind of, uh, um, uh, great kind, sorry. <laughs> my wife has called me twice. Uh, and I've had to ignore it on my phone because I record on my phone. And then I just saw... I have to put on Do Not Disturb. Um, so I got good news. So I'm trying not to think about that good news. And you know me, I don't edit my videos, so I'm just gonna keep plowing ahead. <laughs> it's good to get good news though. Been getting a lot of bad news lately. Anyways, um, just, just I like these guitar lines. Again, the album is too clean, but it's not totally clean. And there's a certain roughness to this album that I really appreciate. A very catchy chorus, even though the lyrics are a little bit non sequitur. Um, like, listen, I walk in the city at midnight with my past strapped to my back. I can't get no sleep. I'm an insomniac. I know that there's too many yes men around Mick Jagger, but if you are one of those people who is in Mick Jagger's circle and you're listening to criticism, tell the dude he doesn't need to rhyme. You don't need to rhyme. You don't need to rhyme. You don't, just you're, <laughs> that's where all of his lyrical problems get into. I'm a real insomniac, that is not a good lyric. 
but I don't really quite get how I want to get close to you is tied into walking around with this past to his back. But this is sort of again, going again to my, to my brother's much more pithy uh, description than this, uh, what is certainly going to be a 40 minute long interview. Um, you know, uh, the past strapped to my back, that's a good line. And I want to go back and just remind you that Mick Jagger is a, like, probably ge genius level lyricist when he wants to be. <laughs> that's, the, that's the crazy thing, right? I mean, how good are the Rolling, the Rolling Stones are so good. They're such a good band. It's so fascinating to review them as they're doing stuff that isn't up to that level. I love the post-chorus for this cowbell and just a great kind of sense of release. I'm going a little far here, but it feels to me like they're trying to recreate a little bit of the magic of a song like Can't You Hear Me Knockin' with the great instrumentals there. And hey, they did it. There's a saxophone solo here. Didn't Bobby Keys die? One of the great things about the Rolling Stones in their heyday is they were capable of making me not hate guitar, uh, saxophone solos, right? I famously have an anti-Clarence Clemens position. Rest in peace. I, I, I like the human being, but I think he ruins every single Bruce Springsteen song that he's on. To the contrary, somehow Bobby Keys works. I think he's dead. So whoever this is that's playing saxophone now, I don't know if it's like a ghostly final recording or not, but it's still, maybe it's the Stones. They just know how to use saxophones here. And they come back to the chorus again, making sure the hook gets stuck in your head. And there's like a little choir outro singing. And you know, there's this little bit at the end where they're recording, and I think it's Mick who's like, yeah. And I believe it, like I believe it. I believe the rawness in this recording. I don't think it's canned recording, okay? So all of you Rolling Stones fans who are mad at me for saying that you only like this album because you're trying to believe that you haven't aged, um, just understand that I can recognize where it's really good too, you know. And, I, and if I'm saying that, it sounds really harsh. You know, this uh, it's my own my own thing, right? Like I'm expressing my own in insecurities about aging, right? So don't think that I think that I'm better than you. I'm just trying to identify the problem that we all have as we age. <clears throat> Then the next song is another great track, okay? So these first three tracks are all super strong, depending on you. Uh, this is why, even though I appreciate Fantano's one-minute review and I understand it, I think it's because he, <laughs> he's too young. So I think if you haven't lived with the Rolling Stones as a huge part of your life, you can't possibly appreciate uh, the when, you know, it all comes across as mediocre when really there's stuff that is mediocre to great. Just great guitar work to start, acoustic and electric. You know, I really like their ballad methods here. Very strong lyrics. Your fingerprints in the dark, your past and presents tangle up in my arms. Our secrets are sealed in our scars, sharing a smoke at the top on the steps of a bar. You know, it's like a little slice of life and image and past. And the things I like about this album, remember how I said he has nothing to say? Well, that may be true, but this is an interesting image that he's, that he's putting out here. The chorus is a buildup of the verse. Um, I'm too young for dying and too old to lose because I was depending on you. You know, like, um, you know, too old, to, too young to die. I mean, hey, again, I hope he lives to be 111. You know what I'm saying? But like, anyways. <laughs> Uh, great post-chorus slide guitar bit here. Instrumental break is cool. Um, as far as like legacy musicians in, uh, Bent Montek is on here, you know, from the from the Heartbreakers. And uh, I have to say that like when I see that Paul McCartney and Elton John and Lady Gaga are all on the album, I'm like, all right, whatever. <laughs> but I see Bent Montek's on the album, I'm like that that is that's exciting to me because. Um, I don't know. He's he's like not a star, but he always brings something whenever he's on anywhere. So he's great. Then we get to the next song, which is fine. Bite my head off, featuring Paul McCartney. It starts off with the counting. It's just a. This is the thing, though. Remember how I said the hooks? So it's hard when. Just so you know, if you do reviews the way I do them, where you just talk uh, too much, according to 26% uh, of you. If you just talk, not that I'm bitter, which I am. If you just talk. It's hard to keep the songs in your head, right? Because you have 12 songs and you're trying to talk about them intelligently. And it would be really nice to be able to just kind of stop and listen. Every single one of these songs, why'd you butt your head off? Why'd you butt my head off? Like, I, I'm actually able to get them in my head. That's a sign of how, uh, how hooky an album is. Um, but I, I like the kind of, like, faux punk of this. Um, and it does now, with Angry, make you think maybe, maybe I'm wrong. 
Maybe they are, maybe Mick does have something to say. Maybe he's just a bitter guy who's at the end of a marriage. Because there's a theme here between this and angry, where basically he's like, why oh, are you talking all this shy about me? You know? <laughs> Great Mick impersonation. I, I learned from Jimmy Fallon. Uh, so, you know, I don't know. Um, well, I ain't on a leash. Well, I ain't on a chain. You think I'm your bitch? I'm fucking with your brain. I, you know, I don't know. It's a, it seems like that might be what this album is partially about. And I also like that the second verse is incomprehensible. Part of the magic of Mick Jagger's songwriting is... This is a story which you won't believe. If, if you're not... If you are not pre-internet, you can't believe this, okay? There was a significant portion of the Rolling Stones lyrics that my brother, his friends, me, my friends, we just didn't know what he was saying, okay? And one time, my brother saw a Rolling Stones lyric book, and he didn't buy it. And he told me, Sky, you need every bookstore I want you to look, and every single place you can possibly look, because we need to find it to get to learn the Rolling Stones lyrics. That's how complicated Exile on Main Street, some of the lyrics on that album, some of the, even some of the lyrics on, on, on uh, Sticky Fingers, okay? <laughs> like, you just didn't know what they were. You had ideas, but you just didn't know. That was the magic of the pre-internet uh, days. And there are some things on here where if I didn't have the lyrics in front of me, I wouldn't know what they are. There's a Paul McCartney bass solo, which is just the saddest moment. <laughs> He's just playing the same notes, just with fuzz on it. And, you know, Mick's like, let's air something! But it was actually more like, <laughs> play the exact same notes. But I do like how Steve Jordan was let a little bit off his leash, which is great. Next track is Whole Wide World, which starts off with these weird kind of studio sound effects. And then Mick Jagger is singing in an accent. Now, if you know anything about the Rolling Stones, you know he sings in an accent all the time. He sings in a Southern American accent. Okay, uh, most of the great Rolling Stones songs, he's singing as though he's from Mobile, Alabama. This song, he sings with a British accent, and it's a little bit surprising. <laughs> it's it's nice, right? Because obviously he's from Hackney or whatever. He's from the the poor working class parts of London, and so I like hearing him sing with it, even though it's it sounds like affect. This is actually not affect, like it. Most of the time he sings with affect, so now that he's not singing with affect, it sounds affected. <clears throat> These are lyrics of him remembering when he was poor, and I, I'm not mad about it. I'm going to be talking a lot about Mick Jagger's wealth and how it impacts this album and makes it unrelatable, but in this case, it's not. You know, he's just remembering. There's memories of my past, the filthy flat and Fulham, uh, which has a team in the Premier League now. The smell of sex and gas, no one ever really knew uh, I never, ever really knew where I was sleeping next. You know, it doesn't matter, the, you know, even though he has a personal fortune worth an excess of $500 million, him remembering this, I still think is valuable. I still think this is a valuable thing to remember. Too much rhyming pressure. You don't need to rhyme rain and disdain. Kind of a weak chorus, kind of like a... The whole song itself feels like... It could be a Kiss song from the 1980s, which is maybe the worst thing I've ever said about anybody. The second verse is about being in jail. So it goes from like him remembering his troubled past to someone else's imagined troubled present. And I don't know why, who's this for? There's a certain element to which you get the sense Mick Jagger's just sitting in one of his villas and it's like, oh, I could write a song about this. Okay, and then he writes a song about being in jail. I do like my probably my favorite line on the album besides uh, I'm still on the pills and I'm going to Brazil is all the guards are lardy louts all the guards are lardy louts but you know I disliked the chorus the first time I was okay with it the second time by the third time it was catchy and I liked it we then get to dreamy skies not dreamy me's dreamy skies the skies up there and this is like, uh, the Rolling Stones were like, what if we tried to do Torn, Torn and Frayed again, but in 2023, uh, without uh, the success, but still it's, it's an okay song. It's got kind of a slide guitar, shuffle, acoustic guitar. It's a nice track, but this is where we get into that wealth issue. So 
He had humble beginnings, okay? But again, he's worth in excess of $500 million. To be fair, before you go, oh, no, he shouldn't have that. If an artist has a certain amount of money, you have to figure that they have made at least 10 times that amount of money for other people, okay? So if Mick Jagger is worth $500 million, he has probably generated in excess of $50 million for other people throughout his life. So let's not criticize whatever money he has, he earned through the brilliance of his own mind, okay? But when he's talking about, I've got to take a break from it all because the wind and the wilderness calls, I'll be, chop <laughs> be chopping up wood. I'll be split. <laughs> I'm sorry. Just the so I don't picture Mick Jagger now. I picture like Mick Jagger, like with his American top hat from the Madison Square Garden shows from Gimme Shelter, like holding on to an axe and sort of doing sort of a like a fay. Like, <laughs> anyways, uh, yeah. So uh, old an old AM radio is all that I got. It just plays some Hank Williams and some bad honky tonk. I, I, I don't know. Hey, it's it's cringy. It's super cringy. It feels like it's a song that's written for for yacht rock purposes, you know, for the the kinds of guys who are watching this video and mad at me for saying that they only like this album because they want to believe that they're still young, uh, you know, that they have a boat and they go out on that boat on the weekend and they can listen to the song or they have a weekend itza, they have like a, a little house on a lake and they can go and listen to the song and it's like Mick really speaks to me. Now to be fair to Mick, you know, being uh, famous is exhausting, right? I believe it was his quote that being uh, famous is meeting people all day. It must be exhausting to be that famous. I don't criticize him for needing a break, but there's a certain folksiness to this, which is just beyond cringy. It actually reminds me a little bit of the David Beckham documentary, which I'm going to do a video on my second channel about how it's uh, a spinoff of the Barbie movie. Like, what if Ken had his own movie? That's what the David Beckham documentary is. But the same kind of thing, like, Beckham is out and he's, like, has this kind of rustic life. And it's, like, just kind of play acting a rustic life. Mess it up. It's cool. I like this song. It's cool. It's like, um, it's like a cross between them trying to still be punk or, like, be punkish. But actually, it's like a Some Girls outtake. It's like disco drums. It's like Charlie's on this song, which is great. And he's doing, like, basically four on the floor disco style. Um, you took my keys, then you nicked my phone, seduced my landlord, broke into my home. Like, Mick, you don't have a landlord, dude. Just seriously, fuck off. Like, just go to hell. Just go to hell with your landlord. Like, you don't have a landlord. Maybe you aren't a landlord, but you can't talk about having a landlord. Okay, <laughs> just, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to get angry, but like, why? W what is this about? But then the chorus has like a full like disco bass here and cool like guitar work. There's like a guitar lead line that if it were played by strings would make it a perfect disco song. Uh, you think I mess it up, mess it up for you. I like it. I like this song quite a bit. He even does a little falsetto singing in I Won't Lie. Kind of a, a reminder of the importance of Charlie, just how, how, great rhythmically this song is and it made me realize i really want more stone, uh, stones disco we then get to the song live by the sword which is <clears throat> a bad song it is the swan song of the rolling stones okay it's charlie watts and bill wyman and mick jagger and keith richards playing together the same way they did back in 1965 okay it's, it's, it's that the original members, minus Brian Jones, all playing together for the first time since whatever, 20 years ago, whenever it was that uh, that Bill Wyman left. But uh, the song's just not good. <laughs> it's like a half-hearted riff. The lyrics are all these cliches. Live by the sword, gonna die by the sword. Live by the cup, gonna die by the cup. Look at a tree and a tree's gonna fall. It, yeah. And then this chorus is like, I'm gonna treat you right. Like, You get the sense that they're like, what should the chorus be? Well, something like I'm going to treat you right, but something better. You know, <laughs> We'll come up with something better. We'll use that as a placeholder. If you want to get rich, better sit on the board. If you want to be poor, better pay the landlord. You son of a bitch. You're coming back with the landlord. What's the deal with the landlord? I, I remind you, Mick Jagger owns homes in London, a chateau in France, a mansion in Florida, a vacation home in Sicily, two vacation homes in the island of Moustique in the Grenadines, and that's just the beginning of it. So just don't talk to me about landlords, dude. If you're locked up in jail, well, you better get free. 
I don't know why they didn't think of that. So this is like multiple, so, so like there's a certain element to which it seems to me he's having a problem that I think a lot of people have when they come from modest means and then they become super successful where like they're trying to relate to their past selves and they don't realize how far they are from their past selves. So like, stop talking about jail. Stop talking about having landlords. It's okay you don't have landlords. Dude, Mick Jagger doesn't have landlords because he's one of the greatest songwriters and businessmen in the history of all art. So it's okay that he doesn't need a landlord. It's okay that he's not in jail and that he could never go to jail because he's too rich. No matter how many songs he wrote <laughs> about statutory rape. Okay? Anyways. I don't know why Elton John's on this song. I don't know why he's on any of these things. He just is a piano player. That's fine. Uh, I do like the claps in the chorus. I like the outro, but then it fades out. Driving me too hard. Hey, we're getting onto this whole theory here. This is a grumpy husband album, okay? Now we're getting to something more interesting because that's something that we can relate to. I can't relate to Mick Jagger talking about needing to pay his landlord, but I can relate to Mick Jagger being a grumpy husband. Now, I'm not a grumpy husband at the moment. I have been a grumpy husband at times. I know a lot of grumpy husbands. I know a lot of grumpy wives. That's something you can write about. You're driving me away. Why don't we just take a break? Where I'm headed, you'll never know. Morocco or a corner bar. <laughs> I'm gonna make a comparison here, which is going to please nobody except for myself. These are very Drake-like lyrics. So Drake uh, has this new habit of talking about the women that he's with and then implying that he will drop them off at public housing if they displease him. This sort of domination that Drake has over people that he's with because he's so desirable and no matter how pretty or attractive uh, or seductive uh, his partners are, he is infinitely more powerful and seductive than them. So you take this line, like, I might go to Morocco or a corner bar, like Mick Jagger can, can pull anywhere he wants in the world in a similar way that Drake can. You know, I'm going to Brazil, I got the pills. Uh, nice enough little riff, the kind of a soft rock chorus, kind of ooze in the back. Uh, another nice lyric here. Look at what you've done to me. You've emptied my eyes. Then we get to the next song, Tell Me Straight, which is a Keith song. And um, I just, it's not a Rolling Stones song. So, right? Like, how is this a Rolling Stones song? You got Steve Jordan and Keith, <laughs> Keith Richards here. Uh, it seems like he's been working a little bit on his singing. It's a little bit better here. Um, just so you know about the misinformation. If you look at the credits of this on title, it says that Mick Jagger is singing this song. So... It's understandable that I didn't know who was playing bass on Angry a month ago. I mean, Mick does do some backup vocals on here. Kind of a sleepy track. I like it, but um, I think I just want another Keith album. That's basically all I want. You know, I said it before, you know, I've seen the Rolling Stones a few times in concert, and I've seen uh, Keith Richards once in concert, and the Keith Richards show was amazing. It was a top-flight rock and roll show as better... I saw Nirvana... Uh, whatever, one year before, one year after, and Keith was 10 times better than Nirvana was back when Nirvana was still Nirvana, okay? Like, that's how good Keith Richards was in concert. It was awesome. So, anyways. Also, Kurt was off that night. Uh, then we get to the song Sweet Sounds of Heaven, featuring Stevie Wonder and Lady Gaga. Here we have some guest appearances that do make sense. Um, I'm very mixed on Lady Gaga. I have a sincere appreciation for what she does and how she does it but I have a sincere dislike for her songwriting and her voice. So um, that's an odd comparison here. I read the story. She tells the story about recording this. And what I like is that <clears throat> I want to say something here. Sweet Sounds of Heaven is a very good song. You're probably confused because I'm like Mr. Bitter, Mr. All This Stuff. It really is. It really is a good song. You have to get over a couple things. You have to get over the faux gospel aspect of it, you know, in the same way that I don't buy Mick as, you know, being a poor guy who has a landlord. I don't buy Mick as a guy who thinks a lot about Jesus. Um, but it is interesting because it is in this context of constantly mentioning the drums as being some kind of recognition of the passing of Charlie Watts. Now, I don't think this is the passing he, I don't think this is the tribute song he would want, okay? But you know, memorials are for the living, not for the dead. Um, but it, it's interesting. So Lady Gaga comes on here, and the way she describes it, she's like, I'm trying not to step on everyone's toes. The whole room was mic'd the way it was in the day. I didn't want my vocals to bleed into the magic they'd been making, the roads, the... Uh, 
uh, keyboard was vibrating furiously through my back and Stevie Wonder was playing, my whole body was shaking. And she talks about like the, the, the sacredness of this recording. So listen, this is not Gimme Shelter, okay? This is not, when I say this is a good song, it is still not as good as the worst song that they recorded bef you know, before 1981. But it's still a very moving song. Bless the Father, bless the Son, hear the sound of the drums and echoes through the valley and it bursts. Let no woman or child go hungry tonight. Please protect us from the pain and the hurt. And here's another thing I never thought I'd say. Lady Gaga totally is awesome. She's amazing on this song. She's really amazing. She hits every note. She doesn't bring any of, like, she, what she said in that interview is that she was trying to imitate what other singers had done with the Rolling Stones, in particular the gospel singers and the backup singers. And she does it. Like, she does it. It doesn't sound like Lady Gaga is on a Rolling Stones song. It sounds like Lady Gaga is singing in a way that the Rolling Stones need her to sing. Almost the same way that that person replaced Bobby Keys, like she's replacing you know, the, the great singers of the Rolling Stones past. A great, huge, big outro, heavenly, the cymbals, horns, and guitar. Uh, and, and, then, and then there's this, like, transcendently amazing moment. Like the best moment on the album, easy, the best moment on the album, where we get the roughness, where there's a, basically the whole thing cuts out and then it's just her singing over the drums and then Stevie is playing and then Mick is like talking and there's Stevie Wonder and Lady Gaga and Mick and they're all together. And it's like this really raw, beautiful moment. Like that's that sacred moment that Lady Gaga was talking about. So no matter how cynical I was or how cynical I am, let's be honest, about this album and about whether or not they have anything to say, I must admit this is a great song and I'm happy it exists. And when they play in concert, I'm sure they're going to play in Buffalo. I'm going to go. And I'll sit through, I'll sit through Jumpin' Jack Flash and I'll sit through Honky Tonk Woman. But I'm there for angry. I'm there for, you know, like, you know how all these artists are like playing their old albums in its entirety, you know? I had this dream, like, what if the Rolling Stones did Exile on Main Street in its entirety? You know, how great would that be? It'd be awesome. But I'd rather see them play this. So. <clears throat> the album ends with Rolling Stone Blues. Uh, I speak very harshly of their album Blue and Lonesome. I re-listened to it. Maybe I'm a little bit uh, too harsh on it. It's not as bad as I remember. Um, it's just... Yeah. You know, like, blues rock is a complicated thing, and especially, like, multi-millionaire blues. There's an old uh, Onion article, uh, Local Man Enjoys and Creates the Blues, which I sometimes feel. You know, it's a cover of a Muddy Waters song, and um, it's good. It's good. So if you told me, hey, Sky, the Rolling Stones are doing a cover of a Muddy Waters song, I'd say, ouch, skip. Um, but it's good, because it's kind of intentionally rough. It's really just Mick and Keith together. Um... I'm gonna cry, cry, cry all the way home, all the way home. Has that kind of feel like they're back in Squatney. Um, the, the the harmonica by Mick is matched perfectly with the guitar. It's a very capable, like the singing is rough and proper. And this is where we get to this funny thing, right? Like I'd rather listen to the Rolling Stones play uh, Robert Johnson's song, right? Whatever, Love in Vain. And I'd sure as hell rather listen to the Muddy Waters original, which you've never <laughs> so good. So it's not like this song needs to exist because there's other Rolling Stones blues songs that are better and the original blues song is better. But at the same time, hearing Mick and Keith play it together in their 80s, or however old they are, it's not better than anything else, but it's nice to hear. It's nice to hear Mick hitting these notes. It's nice to hear him having this like charisma and this draw. And it's, it's good. It's good. I'm surprised to say, but it's good. So there's my review. Um, thank you to my brother and my nephew. <clears throat> I didn't tell them I was going to be quoting them, but they probably know. <clears throat> and uh, uh, once again, if you've never listened to The Witches, check them out. If you like, you know, like bluesy rock and roll, it's still being made out there. There's still good rock and roll out there. And some of it is made by the Rolling Stones. Until next time, there's the camera.